Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Best Practice Strategies and Tools for Scaling Clinical Bioinformatics. It is presented by Elaine G, PhD, the founder and president of Big Head Analytics Group. I'm Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before I begin, I'd like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want, anytime you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. G. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thanks, Judy. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I would like to talk to you today about the best practice strategies and tools for scaling clinical bioinformatics. My name is Elaine G, and I'm the founder and principal consultant of Big Head Analytics Group. We provide consulting services for clinical bioinformatics applications. This talk today will discuss how to leverage compute infrastructure to build a scalable clinical bioinformatics pipeline that is portable, maintainable, and feature rich. According to the Broad Institute, genomic data is doubling in size every eight months. Compute infrastructure today has advanced since the early stages where mainframes were the main the main source of computation. These computers were the size of large rooms and ran off of punch cards that typically held 80 characters per card. Computer programs were first stored in the mid 70s on these write once cards that required a deck of cards to run a computer program. Fast forward to almost 50 years later when we now have enabled both read and write capabilities for data storage. When the floppy markets came, when the floppy disks came onto market, these allowed for read-write capabilities off of a mechanical device, which could store up to a whopping 1.2 megabytes of data. 30 years later, in the, two, in the late 2000s, the USB flash drive came along and could now store much larger volumes of data on the order of 2 to 512 gigabytes per drive. This capacity allowed for smaller, faster, faster and durable storage. In the pursuit of precision medicine, in order to better diagnose, treat, and monitor disease, the search for molecular targets has required complex bioinformatics infrastructure. Single gene assays have evolved into multi-gene evaluations in order to efficiently evaluate multiple molecular targets simultaneously. In a recent study that was published this year, as of August 2017, it was estimated that of the 75,000 genetic test offerings that were available on the market, 14% of these were panel tests, and 1.2% of these tests were whole exome sequencing. More importantly, this paper showed that the rate of new tests emerging on the market was on average 10 new tests per day, where two to three of these tests were panel tests, indicating that there was a need for better compute power as well as data storage. Sequencing technology has been becoming cheaper over time, and this is evident in terms of how genetics sequencing has been scaling. In less than two decades, the scale of sequencing has grown from one genome to a million genomes from the first human genome project that started in 2001-2003. Using the first hierarchical shotgun sequencing technology, the ability for scientists to determine the human genome sequence was a major achievement. They were able to cover about 90% of the genome with four to five X coverage in the first draft that was published in 2001. Since then, sequencing technology has been scaling orders of magnitude with each new study that has come aboard. As of 2008, the 1000 Genome Project scaled by three orders of magnitude to cover 2,504 genomes. Two short years later, at the UK 10K Project, they scaled yet again by an order of magnitude to cover 10,000 patients, where 40% of these patients were sequenced um, across their entire genome. Two years later in 2012, the Genomics England project scaled yet again in order of magnitude to 100,000 genomes. Today, the NIH has started a new study called All of Us, which aims to 
sequence 1 million genomes. In order to support 1 million samples from a clinical bioinformatics perspective, this requires a scalable bioinformatics ecosystem. In order to achieve a million samples, the NIH had requested that genome centers could process 200,000 samples a year. This is equivalent to one, processing one genome every three minutes. As you can imagine, this would require a highly scalable bioinformatics ecosystem in order to process this number of samples in this short of time. In order to achieve this scale, we need to optimize the bioinformatics pipeline development across three major parts of the pipeline development cycle. The first step is to optimize on the pipeline development side. The second is to ensure high quality clinical bioinformatics through pipeline testing and quality assurance. And lastly, to also scale at the stage of pipeline staging and develop and deployment. Because the clinical bioinformatics product life cycle is something that is iterative, requiring constant technical implementation, this cycles around and repeats itself as each new feature is released. Typically, clinical bioinformatics teams may not necessarily be formally trained in clinical bioinformatics. Because this is such a new field, many of the contributors who work in clinical bioinformatics typically build scientific software um, in an ad hoc fashion because they may not necessarily be uh, classically trained computer scientists or software engineers. They typically come from backgrounds specifying in biology um, as well as mathematics and may not necessarily be professional software engineers. In this paper that was published in 2011, they summarize some typical symptoms that are common of ad hoc, ad hoc scientific software development. Some typical issues include, it's almost finished. This pipeline is not maintained anymore. The programmer has left the lab. This program doesn't work. This function is not documented and it doesn't compile on my machine. From a clinical bioinformatics perspective, ad hoc software with these types of symptoms are unacceptable and also limit the ability to scale your ecosystem. So today I'm going to convince you that leveraging best practice tools and strategies will allow you to scale your bioinformatics pipeline without sacrificing quality. Here is a cartoon from XKCD, which uh, highlights and makes pokes fun at the ability to uh, utilize best practices. On the left, it says, I could restructure the program's flow or just use one little go-to instead. And eh, scoop good practice. How bad can it be? Compile. And on the right, you can see what happens. So this cartoon is all in good fun, but it actually does highlight an issue that had ar arisen not that long ago. Back in 2014, there was a go-to bug in the Apple iOS system that exposed an SSL security vulnerability where duplicate go-to fail statement in a program allowed for um, unauthenticated access to a given program. Because of this duplication in the go-to command, the security system of the program was no longer providing the needed SSL authentication. Tools like unit tests and other uh, tests that I'll talk about later in this talk today can help to reduce these types of errors from propagating into your production pipeline. In my talk, the go my goal is to give you a high-level outline of how best practices in software engineering and DevOp DevOps methodologies can be integrated into your bioinformatics platform. The session is intended to introduce the audience to modern technologies for application development and deployment that is relevant to the clinical practice of bioinformatics. Informatics technology must be kept up, kept up in order to scale and to handle new analysis as it comes in, whether it be including unique molecular identifiers, uh, incorporating analytics to support low levels of detection for circulating cell-free DNA applications, or to handle the growing databases of information that's required for annotation in order to perform clinical interpretation. The goal is to create value through automation and software infrastructure with your bioinformatics platform. So in order to handle large volumes of data, the bioinformatics can take advantage of automation at many levels of your platform, from resource optimization, continuous integration, as well as orchestration management. In this talk, we'll focus on describing mechanisms to support each of these levels through workflow engines, testing frameworks, containerization, and operation intelligence. 
By integrating standardization and automation at these levels, you can achieve scalable clinical bioinformatics platforms. Today will be a general introduction to the key concepts and fundamentals of a scale, scalable bioinformatics ecosystem, which will focus on automating at many levels. I'll discuss using software engineering techniques and best practices to create a robust and scalable infrastructure to support the detailed analysis workflows required for NGS-based genetic tests. We'll focus on scaling bioinformatics by leveraging infrastructure to build a scalable and portable modern bioinformatics pipeline to use testing frameworks and containers to facilitate validation of a bioinformatics pipeline and to review some tools for real-time pipeline and compute infrastructure monitoring in production. From this talk, we'll achieve the following learning objectives. We'll be able to understand how to design a modern bioinformatics pipeline using a workflow framework, use Git to manage software versions throughout the bioinformatics development lifecycle, set up a continuous integration environment to improve the quality of code change integrate into a bioinformatics software during development, use container technology to achieve pipeline reproducibility and interoperability between compute platforms, and apply current bioinformatics validation guidelines to bioinformatics compute infrastructure. This talk will not cover deep topics of security or privacy or be a comprehensive outline of how to validate such an infrastructure. There are solutions that are commercially available for off-the-shelf bioinformatics that take advantage of some of these technologies described in this talk, but the details outlined here are relevant for building in-house solutions. I will also not focus on describing the expertise required um, in terms of FTE requirements for building this infrastructure, but instead will highlight the advantages and utility of each piece of technology from the context of building a scalable clinical bioinformatics infrastructure. In this talk, I will also use examples based on Python, but concepts can be generalized to other common languages. Additionally, this talk will not describe recommended tools for sequence alignment and variant calling or other bioinformatics tools. So before we develop the bioinformatics pipeline, it's important to understand the feature requirements defined by the clinical utility of your assay. Before we get started, I would like to review a couple of poll questions if you have time to answer. The first poll question is to cover which of these aspects of bioinformatics development is the most challenging for your team. A, scaling performance, B, achieving faster development cycles, or C, implementing validations. The second poll question will cover what part of your bioinformatics pipeline needs the most work to scale? Is it A, the analytical pipeline, B, validation, or C, compute infrastructure and data storage? And lastly, how many samples does your bioinformatics pipeline support in a week? Less than 50, 50 to 500, or greater than 500? Please consider these questions as you think about how to scale your bioinformatics ecosystem. Let's first automate at the level of pipeline development in order to help, to help to scale our bioinformatics ecosystem. It's important to set the foundation for scalability at the level of pipeline development by applying some key concepts um, summarized here. Today, we'll talk about imparting scalability through workflow engines, using interactive computing environments, as well as to take advantage of parallel development using version control and tools like Gitflow. First, we can talk about how to automate your pipeline execution using a workflow engine. On the right, you'll see that there is a section of code shown that it describes a rule called align with BWA. A workflow engine allows for standardization of your bioinformatics pipeline by clearly delineating the inputs, outputs, commands, parameters, as well as compute parameters needed to run your specific analytics. On the left is a table showing a summary of various types of workflow engines that can be utilized to develop your bioinformatics pipeline. It summarizes the ease of development, the ease of use, as well as performance considerations. More specifically, a workflow engine is comprised of multiple rules that are chained together as shown on the bottom right. A workflow engine not only standardizes each of these analytic rules, analytic steps into rules, but also displays the workflow in a graphic called this directed acyclic graph on the bottom. This DAG also allows for the user to understand how data provenance is maintained throughout your bioinformatics pipeline by clearly showing how inputs and outputs feed into each rule that comprises your entire bioinformatics pipeline. So for example, this align with BWA rule is the first step of this pipeline 
and is defined by inputs that require the FASTQ files, as well as commands and for BWA, as well as the human reference. It also defines what type of outputs are generated from this rule and how it feeds into the other commands. By providing a shell command, the parameters that are defined in both your configurations as well as within the rule can be used to run BWA, and controlling the threads using the thread command within this rule set allows for this workflow to be scaled across any computer platform. Second, we're going to talk about interactive computing environments such as Jupyter. This allows you to document as you go during the pipeline familiarization and optimization process. Here's an example of a paper that was published in PLOS Computational Biology. These authors provided Jupyter notebooks to show how they generated the figures that were published in their paper. This type of document as you go methodology can be applied to the development of your bioinformatics pipeline by allowing for side-by-side -side documentation of both the code that generates the analytics as well as human language to interpret how the analytics was done. So here's an example of um, the Jupyter notebook that was used to generate figure, supplementary figure three in this PLOS computational biology paper. As you can see at the top, there is a title that describes the purpose of this notebook, as well as a description of the downstream analysis at a really high level. Each section of code is known as a code block and is labeled by the number in which it was executed in order to generate the downstream outputs. As we move down, you can see that there's a detail of the normalization algorithm that was used to generate the plot below, as well as the corresponding code block that performed the normalization analytics. Skipping through a couple of code blocks, you can see that at the end of your Jupyter notebook, when it's run, it will generate the output from the entire notebook. And in this case, this is the supplementary figure that was found in the paper. By applying this type of methodology, this will allow for bioinformatics pipelines to be built as well as document, documented at the same time. This will help during the familiarization optimization process, um, as well as downstream documentation that's needed for validation. And lastly, I'd like to talk about scaling pipeline development using software version control and branching and merging strategies. Here's an example of how a potential Git flow could be used in order to leverage the number of resources that are on your bioinformatics team. So typically, a branching strategy um, requires understanding the differences between the various branches that exist. Typically, the um, continuous branches known as dev and prod are continuously in existence in order to represent the source code changes that exist during development as well as what is used in production. Typically, the production branch will contain the code that was released um, into your clinical bioinformatics um, environment that is used to process after the pipelines have been validated. So to orient you, if you look on the dev branch, there, during the pipeline development cycle, uh, by the end of the uh, feature development, there will be a release candidate that's identified. When this release can candidate or RC is identified, the corresponding source code is migrated over to the test branch. This test branch will be used to evaluate whether or not the pipeline can be properly validated. And if there's any issues or bugs that are identified during the testing, uh, these bugs will be fixed in the dev branch and re-released to the test branch. If the validation completes successfully, this uh, tested or validated version of the bioinformatics pipeline can then be released to prod as version 1.0.0. So let's say you're in production and an issue has occurred where there's a bug that needs to be fixed immediately. And so you can branch off what is called a hotfix branch, which will then take the commit that has been released in production and a bioinformatician shown here in red can work on the bug that was identified and commit code changes back to the test environment to be tested. Once the particular code changes have been validated and approved, then these uh, code changes can be released to the version 1.0.1 .1 in the production branch, as well as also merged back into the development branch to keep the code in sync. So during this whole process, there are two other bioinformaticians shown here in blue and green. We're working on the next set of features to be released in the next version of the pipeline. 
So during this time, they've been working on the released version of the production branch and committing changes in order to allow for these features to occur. Over time, they will also be able to incorporate the bug fixes from the hotfix branch provided by the bioinformatician shown in red into their code so that when they are done and complete, they can push their changes to the dev branch so that it, the cycle of testing and production and release can continue. This concept of, of GitFlow described here can allow for multiple bioinformaticians to work on the same source code base simultaneously on various versions at the same time. This will allow for <coughs> bug fixes <clears throat> excuse me, bug fixes to be um, addressed to handle any issues that arise in production, as well as to also allow for asynchronous development of new features to be released in the next version of the pipeline. Now we will talk about automating at the next level. So here we're talking about pipeline quality control and using testing frameworks to allow for automation in order to scale. The first level of testing typically is comprised of the unit tests. This allows us to perform detailed testing on our Bioinformatics pipeline to ensure that the appropriate quality is there. Here's an example of a really simple script that um, displays how a VCF could be read. This function read VCF can be developed in order to process incoming outputs from a variant caller, for example. In this case, in order to, to identify that the function performs appropriately, the unit test can be just defined by testing various use cases, which can um, be multiple in nature, as well as particular edge cases that may, that may require evaluation. So for example, um, one particular edge case may be uh, testing whether or not the function properly handles an empty VCF. Some use case testing that could happen is to ensure that your pipeline is properly reading um, SNVs, indels, structural variants, as well as other types of complex variants that may typically be represented um, through symbolic notation or other version types of the VCF. By using unit tests to perform the detailed testing of various use and edge cases, this ensures the developer that the clinical bioinformatics pipeline is performing as expected. Additionally, a layer on top of the unit test is what is known as an integration test. Shown here on the left is the same DAG that I introduced in the workflow framework discussion earlier. As you can see, a clinical bioinformatics pipeline is quite complicated where there are various aspects of your workflow that have been paralyzed as shown by the repeated rule sets, um, for example, in the first half of the workflow um, that then converge into downstream rules in order to generate the final set of variant calls for human interpretation. Because these rules integrate together in a complex fashion, it's important to perform an end-to-end -end evaluation using integration tests. So typically an integration test is less detailed as what was described for unit tests, but allow for the user to test certain file types um, being processed by your entire workflow and to ensure that it properly um, identifies the variants expected. So for example, a bioinformatics pipeline can be broken down into four major functional groups to cover demultiplexing and base calling, read mapping and processing, variant calling, as well as variant annotation and filtering. By pushing through specific files and folder sets, we can look at the output of your pipeline to see if the SNV, indel, and structural variant calling is as expected. By performing this end-to-end -end evaluation, we can be confident that the clinical bioinformatics pipeline is, can be um, executed end-to-end -end sufficiently despite the complexity of the underlying rule sets within the workflow engine. The third level of automations and standardization will encompass pipeline packaging, validation, and delivery. We can containerize the pipeline for scalable deployment. A container typically allows for certain features to exist. So if you look at the right side of the slide, you'll see that containers can provide flexibility. They are lightweight as compared to virtual machines. They're interchangeable and portable, meaning that they can be executed on various compute platforms um, while maintaining the same type of execution within the application. And because they are containerized, they allow for the scaling of your application by deploying these containers, and they're stackable to allow for uh, distributed computing applications to be developed. <clears throat> 
One vendor that's popular is the Docker container, which um, allows for open source use of the containerization technology. So if you look to the left, um, a Docker container is typically built out of a file called the Docker file. The Docker file defines the type of environment that is to be um, installed into your container, as well as maps any external ports that are necessary to allow for reference files or input files to be consumed by your Docker container. These Docker file files are then built in order to generate an image. And this image contains the code, the runtime environment, such as Python 3, um, any necessary libraries in which your applications are dependent on, description of any environmental variables that are needed for execution of your application, and configuration files that can be defined that can parameterize your uh, clinical pipeline. The nice thing about these images is that they can be tagged and published in a very similar way to the source code that we described with Git. By tagging and publishing your images, they can be stored into a registry that can either be made public or private. From this registry, it provides a central repository that can be used in which these containers can be pulled and run on a specific compute node. So you can imagine by centralizing these images into a, a repository or registry that can be used to pull down containers, um, you can start to think about compute environments that can be scaled um, according to your sample volume that then utilizes containers for execution of your bioinformatics pipeline in a consistent fashion. As we start to scale, it's important to maintain high quality pipelines um, by utilizing some uh, tools like this continuous integration framework. The continuous integration environment utilizes an automation server to perform three major tasks of building, testing, and deploying your bioinformatics pipeline. By utilizing the continuous integration framework, it will trigger builds each time a commit is made to a specified branch. This allows for testing to happen before the source code change is integrated into the major branches of your repository. So this allows for bug detection to occur much more quickly um, because code that is committed that generates downstream bugs are identified early on. This allows for the code to be kept in a deployable fashion at any point in time because the code changes that are integrated into your main branches have been tested for bugs. Now, of course, the continuous integration environment is only as good as the unit tests and, and integration tests that I talked about before. Without thorough testing development, the continuous integration environment may not necessarily be effective. So now that we've talked about how to build and test containers um, with each source code change, we can talk about how to deploy these containers at scale. And we do this using orchestration management tools. On the top left, I summarize a few examples of orchestration management tools. Um, either built in endogenously with Docker Swarm and Stack Deploy, or using other frameworks like Kubernetes that are based out of the Google Container Engine and also implemented in Azure as the Kubernetes service. There are other orchestration management tools that are also popular, including Apache Mesos and the Amazon Elastic Container Service in AWS. The basic concept of an orchestration manage management tool is that it deploys your Docker containers on any new worker nodes that are spun up. A master node can be used to provision any new worker node that's brought onto your compute cluster. So as I mentioned before, the Docker containers can be stored in a trusted registry. And by spinning up the worker nodes, the master node can communicate to the new worker node which container to pull down and to run on its compute resources. This allows for a scaling of your compute environment by spinning up or spinning down worker nodes as the sample volume changes. Here's an example of a um, compute infrastructure that is openly available that allows for a bioinformatics ecosystem to scale by leveraging workflows and containers. The FireCloud is a system platform that has been built at the Broad Institute. As you can see, this allows for various pipelines to be run, and it takes advantage of this Whittle workflow um, in order to uh, execute the bioinformatics pipelines. These Whittle workflows are stored in Docker containers and executed on the Cromwell engine uh, using bash execution. And taking advantage of the pipelines API on Google Cloud allows for these 
uh, Docker containers and workflows to be run on the Google Compute Engine. So the tools that I've talked about so far for standardization automation can be leveraged to help with performing validations. This can allow for um, addressing various features of an analytic validation that's required for the bioinformatics pipeline. Uh, recently, there's been published a validation set of guidelines that, that summarizes 17 major um, guidelines or recommendations to be addressed during a bioinformatics validation. By leveraging these standardization automation tools, we can allow for the analytic validation to be accurate, robust, reproducible, traceable, secure, and compliant. For example, in order to, su to support accuracy, the interactive computing environment allows for documentation during the familiarization and optimization steps, as well as taking advantage of the unit tests and integration tests to ensure that functionality is appropriate. To make these pipelines robust, the continuous integration environment takes advantage of these unit tests and integration tests to ensure that the function is there, as well as the workflow engines allow for standardization as well as scalability within your bioinformatics pipeline. Containerization allows for these pipelines to be robust and reproducible by providing version control on your pipeline, as well as um, storage in a central location of your source code in a central repository or registry. The workflow engines also help with providing traceability through DAG visualization of your inputs and outputs throughout the rules, set of rules that are required for a given bioinformatics pipeline, as well as generates infrastructure logs that can be reviewed. Security is provided through roles and security groups in your compute infrastructure, as well as allowing for real-time monitoring of these logs to see if your pipeline is performing as desired. And lastly, uh, interactive computing, continuous integration, and version version control also allow for compliance through documentation. Lastly, I'd like to focus on um, how to monitor pipelines in production at scale. And we'll do this by speaking about real-time monitoring software tools. Operation intelligence tools give real-time insight into operations into your compute environment. So let's say on the left, you have a compute environment that's comprised of master nodes, worker nodes, as well as databases. Um, they may be on-premise, they may be in the cloud or a hybrid version of the two. These operation intelligence tools like Splunk allow for the user to have a single pane of glass visualization, as shown on the right, of various aspects of your compute infrastructure. This will allow for um, observation of various logs, as well as allow for the user to set up warnings or alerts depending on changes that are unexpected from the performance of your pipeline. Some of these operation intelligence tools requires knowledge of specific language, uh, query language, in order to develop these um, alerts um, and notifications. But they provide uh, your system administrator the ability to have a single overarching view of the performance of your pipeline to allow for the administrator to understand if there's been any security breaches or performance failures um, when jobs are executed on those that scale. Lastly, I'd like to highlight a couple of other considerations to consider when building a modern bioinformatics ecosystem that I will not cover in detail today. These aspects can cover various uh, designs for data storage to efficiently query as well as share genomic information. This impacts how the data sharing um, interfaces can be designed to allow for scalable data sharing for your clients. There's also considerations when it comes to processing large volumes of genetic information by applying big data techniques, such as Hadoop or MapReduce. And then lastly, the ability to design new tools using artificial, artificial intelligence techniques, such as machine learning algorithms, to query across these large data sets efficiently to gain new insights relevant for variant interpretation. So in summary, uh, we were able to review various aspects of a modern bioinformatics platform um, that will impart scalability throughout your bioinformatics ecosystem. We discussed the four major levels in which the scalability can be applied from pipeline development to pipelines in production, 
including aspects of quality control, packaging, validation, and delivery. And with this, we discuss tools for research optimization with workflow engines, continuous integration to automatically check for breaking changes when source code commits are performed, as well as strategies for containerizing your pipeline and deploying these containers using orchestration management tools. And lastly, to achieve final scalability, uh, we talked about real-time operation intelligence tools for monitoring performance of many worker nodes at once. So I hope now I've convinced you that you are one step closer to building a modern bioinformatics ecosystem. And here's my last XKCD um, cartoon that describes how a, someone who is self-taught may now necessarily consider reading a style guide in their development. I hope you also feel empowered to explore these tools in more detail in your own clinical bioinformatics platform. I'd like to thank you all for your attention and I appreciate your attending my talk. Um, again, my name is Elaine G and here's my email address as well as my social media handles if you'd like to reach out to me uh, for any additional questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. G, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click on the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. So let's get started. Our first question is, I have a small bioinformatics team to work with. What's the best place to start in order to scale at our institution? Thanks. That's a great question. I think it depends on where your needs are. <clears throat> of course, the most important aspect of developing a bioinformatics pipeline is, is validation. So I would recommend looking at your validation process and understanding what limitations are most urgent, and then to go back and to consider whether workflow engines, containerization, or unit testing or integration testing could help benefit that validation process. Thank you. Okay, next one is, my team does not have formal training in software development without formal training. Yes, that's a great question as well. So as I mentioned earlier, not all bioinformatics teams are formally trained in software engineering or software best practices. Um, as an example, I was formerly the director of bioinformatics at AUP, and the team that I worked with also had a very similar background um, in terms of formal training. With that team, we basically enabled the individuals to perform the education required on the job, and they were able to design um, with appropriate leadership a elastic compute infrastructure that can now scale the support of NGS assays at AREP. Thanks. Next one is, which workflow language is best to start with? So typically in the clinical bioinformatics or bioinformatics industry, um, Python is a popular programming language because it's really easy to use, as well as has support for many libraries that are necessary to perform the analytics required. Um, it also has a significant number of libraries if you're looking to design machine learning algorithms and many workflow engine frameworks that are designed in Python as well. Thanks. Looks like we have time for one more question. What part of the bioinformatics pipeline do I containerize? That's a great question. Um, in this case, I would recommend looking at the use cases in which you're uh, developing a bioinformatics pipeline for. And depending on the reusability that's necessary within your bioinformatics pipeline, I would recommend splitting your uh, workflows or pipelines into containers using those breaks that you can repeat the um, functional analysis required by those containers in any type of downstream application. Thank you. I would like to once again thank Dr. G for her presentation. I'd also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I wanna let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February 15th, 2019. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event.
That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.